You're listening to the Belly Dance Geek Clubhouse at bellydancegeek.com. Hello, everybody. I'm Nadira Jamal, and welcome to episode 49 of the Belly Dance Geek Clubhouse. The Clubhouse is a place where dancers can get together and geek out on all of those things that are hard to get in classes and on DVDs. So every month, I interview a different guest expert on a different topic. Because if you want help with things like the what, so things like moves, combos, choreography, technique, it's really easy to get help with those things. But if you want to dig a little bit deeper into the why and the how, so things like culture, musicality, business, ethics, well, all of that can be a little bit harder to find. So every month we have a different guest expert, and we always have time for question and answer so that you can geek out too. So if you think that knowledge and creativity go together like chocolate and peanut butter, you are in the right place. My guest tonight is Shahrazad Khorsandi. Uh, she was born and raised in Iran and has been passionately involved in the dance since childhood. She studied dance and performance art at the California Institute of the Arts, holds a bachelor's, uh, excuse me, a BA in dance and an MA in creative arts from San Francisco State University. Drawing upon her deep familiarity of authentic Persian dance, her formal dance training, and her intrinsic knowledge of Persian aesthetics, Shahrazad, a pioneer in Persian dance, has created a formalized dance vocabulary and structure for Persian dance, helping in the artistic development and dissemination of an art form that continues to face social and political obstacles. Her unique approach to creating Persian dance pieces has prompted her to identify her dance style as contemporary Persian ballet. You can check her out at dancepersian.org. So welcome, Shahrazad. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I'm so happy to have you. So today, Shahrazad is going to give us an introduction to Persian dance, and we're going to be talking about a lot of the background, so history, culture, features, and aesthetics of the dance. But also, since most of our listeners are coming from the belly dance world, we're also going to compare and contrast that with Rock Sharky as we go. So I always like to start with my guest's origin story. So can you tell us about how you got started in Persian dance? Sure. Well, I was born and raised in Iran, so um, my first introduction to uh, dance and music was through Persian music and Persian social dance. That was um, the first language of movement that I was introduced to. Um, I moved to the U.S. when I was 11, and I definitely had a passion for dance. So I actually did not think about Persian dance at that point. I started uh, taking dance classes um, when I was about uh, 13. Uh, first was jazz and then ballet and modern. And um, I auditioned for California Institute of the Arts and ended up going there for a few years and heavily studying uh, modern dance um, and falling in love with it. And it wasn't until later on after I actually finished my schooling that um, when I started to uh, create my own dances and, and try to express myself through uh, the language that I had learned, that I realized there was something missing. Uh, like I didn't quite have uh, the tools to express what I needed to express in an organic way. So I started to play around with that and try to find my, my voice in dance and choreography. And as I did that, um, it started to dawn on me that um, everything that felt natural to me in my expression had a sort of a Persianness to it, a Persian twist to it. And um, or at that point, I thought it just seemed kind of strange and off and different. And in my um, exploration and in trying to decipher how it was different and what made it different from the forms that I had studied, I started to realize that it's it's the Persian aesthetics trying to come through. It's the Persian language of movement and expression that's trying to come through. And that also coincided with my going back to uh, visit Iran after 13 years of uh, having been away. And it kind of uh, opened the door uh, where things started flooding back in emotionally um, in terms of imagery. Um, and so all of that kind of uh, flooded in and uh, came together in a, a choreographic voice or a, a dance voice. So that's kind of a, a short version of how I got into it. But after that, I realized that um, that's what I need to do is just really go in that direction and explore Persian dance more. And as I did it, I realized that it's really a hidden gem, um, that it, it's not just me um, needing to express myself in that way, but there's beauty in that form of expression that others who are not even familiar with it uh, or weren't born in that culture see it. They see the beauty and they um, 
have a need to express that part of themselves as well. So it feels good to introduce people to this type of expression and watch them find that part of themselves and that part being uh, sort of a, a feminine, um, very natural, organic uh, connection to nature, to the cosmos. Um, and yeah, so that that's kind of how I got into it and, and fell in and actually really started doing mainly just that and uh, not so much uh, modern dance, which I also still love, and I love to do the fusion of modern and Persian as well. Mm. And, you know, specifically relevant to my listeners, um, how is it that you came to work with members of the belly dance community? Well, no one seems to know what Persian dance is, you know, and most people, when they hear the word Persian, they think, okay, well, they either have no clue where it is, or they think, oh, it's in, it's in the Middle East, therefore it must be belly dance, because a lot more people know about belly dance, even if they don't know much about it, they've at least heard of it. Um, so the the dancers that are not uh, aware of uh, or not into Middle Eastern dance or belly dance really don't know about Persian dance and aren't interested in Persian dance, unfortunately. They're kind of in, in just different genres. It's the Middle Eastern dancers or the belly dancers that often know about Persian dance. A lot of them uh, begin with the Egyptian dance or something, and then they kind of want to explore and see what other types of Middle Eastern dance there are. Um, maybe they'll learn about Turkish dance or different kinds of uh, folk dances from different parts of the Middle East, and then they'll kind of get a glimpse of Persian dance. They kind of search around and see what other types of Middle Eastern dance there are, and then they find Persian dance, and there are those who um, just fall in love with it and, and see uh, a certain quality in it that's different from other Middle Eastern dances that they like, um, or they like to add that to their repertoire. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that you touched on is, you know, a lot of Americans kind of see the Middle East as one big monolith. And that's, I think, something that um, folks in the belly dance community are starting to become much more aware of. So, you know, given that we're talking about a very large, very diverse area, um, when we're talking about Persian in this context, what, what do we really mean? Um, it, geographically, it's the country of Iran. Um, it just depends. It's more of a when than a where, <laughs> because the further back you go in time, the bigger the Persian Empire was. So um, there are people who perform Persian dance, or what, what they call Persian dance, but uh, based on today's geography, it's really um, Tajik or Uzbek dances that used to be part of the, uh, some of the Central Asian um, areas that used to be part of the Persian Empire. So it really, it's kind of vague. It's, it's hard to draw that line. But basically, uh, Persian is synonymous or is used synonymously as Iranian. So it's the country of Iran um, and, and sometimes the surrounding countries that used to be a part of Iran. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that I think um, is a really big gap in our education is I think a lot of people realize that um, Persians and Iranians are not Arabs. Uh, you know, not the entire Middle East is an right. Arabic piece. And so, you know, because we've got these different cultural and ethnic forces going on, the dance is going to be different. The culture is going to be different. Um, is there any way that that plays out that you feel is important to know before we go into the rest of this conversation? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, uh, Persians are of Indo-European faith, and the Persian language is um, originally a completely different language from Arabic, although uh, the, the alphabet now looks almost identical at some point. I don't know exactly when uh, in history you have to ask the linguist, but at some point the alphabet will change, but the origin of the language is actually completely different. I think it's actually more connected to Latin, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite different, different, uh, different ethnicity altogether, uh, which just happened to be in in the same region. Of course, you know, being in the same region, there are going to be similarities. The music is uh, quite different, uh, and I think a little bit harder for Westerners uh, to understand than, um, than Arabic rhythm. The Arabic rhythm seems to be a little bit more similar, a little bit more intuitive um, for um, non-Persian than Persian music. Um, but yeah, it's a whole different, um, different uh, ethnicity altogether <laughs> and language. Indo-European. Awesome. Well, let's jump in on some of the history. So um, can you tell us um, about the history of Persian dance? Do we know how far back it goes, what influenced it, or when and how it was performed? 
Um, yeah, there's been some writings on it, not a whole lot, but uh, one book I would recommend is Dr. Anthony Shea's uh, book called Choreophobia. He goes into a whole section of uh, detailed history based on his own research and quotes others who have written about it too. But basically, um, briefly, it goes uh, way back to ancient Persia. You could see uh, evidence, iconographic evidence on pottery of uh, dance figures. Um, so throughout the different eras, uh, there were pottery or wall paintings or uh, silver vessels, uh, lusterware. So um, with all these artifacts, when you look at them, there are always some kind of dance um, figures, uh, either solos or duets, doing movements. So you can tell that dancing was definitely um, a part of the culture, which makes sense. I mean, I can't imagine, uh, really intuitively, I can't imagine any culture, any in a human culture, not having dance as a very primal way of expressing yourself, maybe even before verbal language in any culture. Um, but it goes way back um, to, to those times. And then um, as far as uh, written history of it, um, the thing is not many Persians, Iranians, had written uh, about Persian dance, unfortunately. And the writings that we do find are were written by the Greeks or other others from the West. And especially at that time, there was not a whole lot of consideration given to ethnocentrism. So it's hard to get an objective view of uh, what the dancing was like. Um, often the descriptions by um, the, by outsiders uh, were kind of negative. Uh, mm -hmm. Saying, oh, they move their hips in a strange way, or you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, some of them, there was, you know, a few that actually said, oh, the dances were beautiful and, um, you know, sensual without being inappropriate or something. But for the most part, there was um, a portrayal of uh, no morals and uh, a lot of uh, negative stigma um, associated uh, with Persian dance. And a lot of times it was connected to prostitution even. Um, and then let's see. Then there's Persian miniature paintings a little bit later in history uh, where um, Persian dancers dancing was um, portrayed. And uh, those were the Persian miniature paintings were kind of an idealization of beauty. And so everything was really um, just really beautiful and dreamy and perfect and perfectly stylized. And the dance style that is inspired by that is a little bit like that as well. It's, it's all about a dreamy kind of beauty. Um, and so they often showed the dancers as young and beautiful and perfect and, and not very realistic. Uh, but when you read about some of the, the history in, during that time, so actually they had dancers of different um, body shapes and different ages. Uh, there, were, there were things written about um, you know, bald-headed men dancing. So a lot of it was, because it was done in the courts in those days a lot, um, it was about how well you could entertain and engage the audience. Uh, for example, during the Bajar dynasty about um, maybe 100, 150 years ago, there was a lot of acrobatic movement, hand stance and different things um, that were portrayed in the paintings of the dancers. So it was kind of like whatever you could do to engage the court, to um, engage the audience, and to uh, make yourself um, stand out so that you'd get hired to dance at the court. It was an entertainment. So there was different ways of uh, portraying, but definitely uh, going back to the artifacts found in ancient times, um, all the way up to old photographs, and before that painting, you see that dancing as both um, an entertainment and a social uh, phenomena were um, in existence. So if we step into more recent history, um, you know, it, it seems like a big turning point in all of this would be the Iranian Revolution. Um, do we know much about the dance in the years leading up to that? So, you know, in like the last like 50, 60 years? Yeah. Um, so during the Pahlavi dynasty, which was uh, before the, the Islamic Revolution, um, there was a huge fascination with the modern and Western world. So there was uh, a big Westernization happening. Um, there was um, a sort of a, 
uh, reluctance to accept uh, traditional music and dance and, and fashion and everything. Uh, and again, it was a fascination with, with the West. Everybody wanted to be Western. So uh, people started to study more of uh, Western instruments and, and kind of looking down upon the traditional instruments and, and musical rhythms and traditional dance styles. Um, it was a way of um, sort of a self-deprecating thing and, and wanting to be more like the West so that you could be as good as the West. And that included the culture of ministry hiring, um, you know, ballet masters from Europe to come and teach ballet to uh, Iranians and also bringing ballet companies and ballet dancers and soloists to put on big ballet performances at the court um, as opposed to really focusing on developing the art of Persian dance. Um, but I do have to say that uh, I remember the, the Queen uh, Farah at that time actually uh, did want to bring out um, the per Persian culture um, more as well. So in conjunction with that, she did support uh, bringing folk dances um, onto the stage. However, the way it was done was still done by hiring ballet, uh, yeah, ballet masters who would come and be in charge of creating these big epic uh, ballets that used Persian music and you know, played around with the idea of Persian dance or, or try to use folk dances um, to create these ballets. So <laughs> it was a little bit hard to to kind of decipher how much of it is truly authentic Persian dance, how much of it was sort of influenced by ballet, because, you know, the understanding was that, okay, well, we, we have to uh, we have to bring technique into this. Let's do this folk dance, but, but let's put technique into it. And by technique, they meant make it more like ballet. Okay, do this, but point your foot and, and make your legs straight. Well, that changes the movement, <laughs> you know. So I think there was a little bit of that. Uh, but there was also a lot of good that came out of um, that because um, it put more importance and significance in uh, the art of dance. Um, and it got, um, you know, enough money and support um, for uh, developing um, shows and, and having dance performances and getting it out there as opposed to it just being uh, a social thing or a low-class type of entertainment. It sounds like, um, for the belly dance audience, it sounds like there's a lot of parallels to what Mahmoud Reda was doing in Egypt um, in, around the same time and a little bit in, from, I think it was, he started in the 50s through the 70s. I, I, I may be misremembering the dates there, but it really sounds like a very similar push. That's, I've heard that before. I've, I've heard that connection you made before, so you're, you're probably on the right track. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. And so, you know, when the revolution kind of came in and was a revolution and changed everything. Uh, what effect did that have on uh, dance and the arts? Wow, a huge effect because um, one of the forbidden things uh, that came out of that is the public display of dance. So it was completely sinful and illegal to perform dance, period, for a long time. Uh, now it's been, I don't know, 35, 37 years, and uh, they've eased up quite a bit. And right now, it's gotten to the point where uh, folk dances are okay. Men can perform folk dances. Women can perform dances for a female audience. But still, what I hear from people is that there's a lot of censorship going on. There's still a lot of fear that any minute um, the, um, I forgot what it's called, the culture, um, the morality police, or whatever, they can change their mind and um, and fine you and make you cancel your your show. And they also monitor what type of dances you do, what type of music you use, if, if they consider it sensual, if it has too much of a dancey groove to it, you can't do it. It has to be conceptual movement. And you can't call it dance. People still call it dance. Call it harmonic movement or harmonized movement or sometimes theatrical movement that they do within the context of a theatrical production. So as long as it tells a story and you're doing movement, it's okay. But you can't call it dance and have a, a rhythm that has a, a dance groove to it and you dance to it in public. So that definitely puts a lot of limitations. Um, I do know that there are now 
um, holding dance classes. You, you, they actually have dance studios that you can rent out and, and have dance classes by women for women only. Um, and they're in sort of a, a basement-like areas with no windows so that no one can see. And, and it's all legal, so you don't have to worry about it. In, in the Probably about 10, 15 years ago, they used to call it um, bodybuilding for women, you know, that kind of thing, because you couldn't even call it, you know, dance or movement. Now I think you can call it, um, you know, harmonized movement or whatever for women. Um, but again, there's a lot of restriction. You have to um, always be in fear of getting caught or being reprimanded or fined and things like that. So it's a struggle. And, you know, what role has, you know, the, the the diaspora community played in the dance? Obviously, not everybody of, you know, Iranian descent lives in Iran. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people left during the revolution. And um, socially, as far as social dance, dance is one of the things that has, has um, you know, kept uh, the the diaspora, the non-dancer, the non-professional dancer uh, in the diaspora are sane because that's part of the culture that um, is so uh, such a significant part of the culture with music and dancing, getting together and dancing, that it's kept the culture alive. That's what people do in the diaspora is to get together and dance. So on a social level, um, that's definitely been going on. And of course, um, in Iran, it's been going on too. It's, it's Even if it's, it's during the first days of the revolution, even social dancing was um, not permitted. If there was music heard coming out of your house or if someone called the police and said that you play music or dancing at your house, they would raid your house. And in the old days, they don't do that anymore. Um, but people, of course, still do it. So on a social level, it's been going on in both places. But in the more, uh, I guess, professional or classical or you know, stage performances, so, um, there are some of us out here that um, are trying to do basically two things. We basically have two roles. One is to uh, preserve the, the culture through Persian dance and to um, make it available to uh, those people, especially the children who were born here, who are Iranian American, born in, in the U.S. or outside of the, the country, outside of Iran, um, to stay familiar with the culture that way, because it's important to the parents that the kids become familiar with the culture, and that's a great way for them to do that. Um, and the other thing is, um, and this is what's really important to me as an artist, is to help develop the art form, because there's so many restrictions in Iran, uh, and we don't have those restrictions here. We, uh, our hands are more free to uh, develop the art form, um, evolve, you know, let it evolve as it would if, uh, let's say, the revolution had not happened, and uh, if Persians were free to um, to really keep exploring and, um, and creating new ways to express themselves within the language of Persian dance. Um, and what I see happening, interestingly, is that there's a tendency for um, those who are in the diaspora to cling on to their image, their connection to Persian dance and Persian culture uh, based on when they left the country. So it's sort of a, a stagnant connection. Um, it, it's that way uh, linguistically because there, there are new lines that are, have spanned over the last uh, 30, 40 years uh, that Persians who, Iranians who live in Iran now um, talk a little bit differently than those of us that are out here. But, you know, we've kind of um, clung onto what we have. We've tried to preserve the culture and we've kind of fallen behind in a way that those who live in Iran have evolved and, and we haven't quite evolved there. And I see that in the dance now that there's a little more um, freedom, and I can see some dances coming out of uh, Iran. I see that they're not so concerned with preserving the culture through dance. They're not so concerned with recreating old dances. They're evolving. They're just trying to express themselves um, with using the language of Persian dance, which comes to them naturally because those aesthetics are embedded in the culture, and they live there. And it's in their subconscious mind. So when they move, when they listen to music, when they play music, when they dance, it comes out in that way. And they or they organically express themselves in that way. And those of us who are out here are in danger of um, recreating, the, the, trying to recreate the same picture uh, in you know, in trying to preserve um, or, or trying to make a connection with our past in a way. So that's a really interesting phenomenon to me. And that's something that I am always playing with uh, with my dance. And sometimes it gets me in trouble because uh, sometimes I'll run into people 
purists or people who, who think, you know, they know what Persian dance is because they've done so much research and study and they're looking at the past and they'll, you know, they'll look at my dance and say, uh, well, is that really Persian? I don't know because it looks a little different. And what kind of costume is that? I don't recognize it. Well, because it's not a period dance. I'm not doing it. Uh, I'm not replicating a court dance from the 17th century. <laughs> I'm a Persian and I'm dancing using uh, Persian aesthetics in my expression in, in a very intuitive and organic way. And yes, when Persians look at my dance, they recognize it as Persian, even if it's new movement that they haven't seen. It doesn't have to be a, a certain specific movement that they recognize from the picture or from something. It's, it's more complicated than that. It's, it's an uh, innate understanding of um, the cultural aesthetics, the same aesthetics that you see in architecture, you hear in the music, you see it in the textile, um, and it uh, manifests itself in movement in a certain way. It's kind of hard to explain. But that's, that's the, the interesting thing I see happening in, in the diaspora and the danger of um, those of us who live in diaspora to become stagnant and to look at our past in trying to preserve the culture and not really letting it evolve. I think that's definitely that's something that goes on in all diaspora communities and is one of the interesting things that happens. So, um, you know, my father's side is I'm third generation Irish on my father's side, but that identity is very important to the culture, even though my grandmother wasn't even born there. And, you know, when I actually visited and, you know, met with my like third and fourth cousins, their experience of the culture was very different from all of these stories that I learned heard growing up because those go back to 18. 1851 and you know our country was not the same in 1851 <laughs> and right. so you know there are definitely right. cultural threads that are that stay but I think we do kind of get caught up in that sometimes and so it's very very interesting to see how um you know not just you know what does that identity mean as you go forward um but also what what threads do stick and which ones don't and what does grow and evolve and how do people deal with that identity so i think the arts are one of the big places where we get to have those conversations yes yes cool. i agree thank god <laughs> cool um now i'd like to talk a little bit before we get into the kind of the form and aesthetics which i'm really really interested in and you've already said so many cool things i want to pick up on um but i want to talk a little bit about um cultural context and this is going to be a little tricky both because you know, we've we've got the diaspora community today, and we've also got what's going on in Iran today. But if we think about the context, you know, who dances, when do they do it, and where do they do it? Um, can you address that in any of these different uh, options? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, well, like I said, dancing is, is a very significant part of Persian culture. Uh, so there is, of course, there are folk dances. Um, that are still around, and um, those are from the more rural areas, not urban areas. And people uh, do those dances at uh, the different events. And actually, even in the urban areas, you see, like you might go to a wedding where um, the you know, a part of the family is from a certain region, and as they dance and, and party, they might you know dance to all these different pop songs, and then all of a sudden there will be a song that's from that specific region. And all of a sudden, those, that side of the family that's from that region will get up and do a certain dance that's very different, and it's a folk dance. So you still see that a lot. So there's definitely the folk dances um, done in celebrations. And it doesn't have to be a big, huge celebration. Persians like to dance even at like baby showers or like my family just kind of gets together on a weekend. And it's like at any time, any excuse when they get together, Music and dancing is a part of it. Um, they don't just mingle and have a drink or eat or whatever. They they play music and they dance. They just get out and and you know make a circle or whatever and and dance. Um, so dance, a uh, social dance is definitely a part of it. Um, let's see. Uh, so folk dance, uh, classical dance. Uh, as far as that performance, like I said, it was um, forbidden. The first. Um, probably a couple of decades after the revolution, but now there are more dancers uh, performing, especially Sufi dance as a, as a genre has, that has really become kind of popular, the um, whirling, whirling kind of dance. Uh, and that's allowed more because it's spiritual and it's not seen as so much um, like a sensual type of dance. Uh, so that's 
actually performed as far as uh, staged dance girls um, were theatrical dances, um, as I mentioned before, in uh, the theatrical context. But those um, are opportunities for choreographers and for dancers to show their work uh, in Iran. And out in diaspora, there are those of us who put on concerts or dance in festivals um, and multicultural events, everything from uh, school and library lecture demos to multicultural festivals, um, you know, by, held by the city or county, that kind of thing. Um, and do yeah, professional performers that, 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 ever get hired just for party entertainment, or is that not something that happens in this genre? You know, interestingly, um, I think maybe they do, but interestingly, um, even persons who hire dancers for their wedding more often are interested in belly dancers. They find that more entertaining than Persian dance. I think part of the reason is that there's still, um, it's still a new concept for a lot of Persians to think of um, Persian dance as a professional thing, because when you talk about Persian dance, it's automatically often seen as social dance. So they'll think, oh, well, we're going to dance anyway. We're all Persian and we're going to do Persian dance. So why should we hire someone and pay someone to come and dance? Because we already know how to dance and we're going to be dancing because they don't draw the line between social dance and classical dance. So it's often seen as that. Um, even in Iran, I remember uh, before the revolution, um, most of the, the dance's entertainment was, was belly dance. That was more interesting to people. They saw it as something different, that someone would get up there and do these interesting moves. Because again, I think they would think of uh, Persian dance uh, as entertainment, as something that they could perhaps do themselves. Or if somebody in the family is a good dancer, they'll just get her to get up and dance and say, well, she, we have a great dancer right here. Why should we hire a, a, you know, a professional dancer? Because it wasn't seen as, you know, like a ballet or something like that. Um, and for entertainment, I think people would rather just dance themselves than to hire. But, but it is changing a little bit. Um, we have, my company has danced at some weddings, not very often, but, uh, but at some. And Unfortunately, there's also that uh, mentality where uh, people don't want to pay for for a dance. You know, they'll pay for the flowers and the food and the cake and the plays. Um, but when it comes to dance, there's this reluctance to want to pay because it's not very tangible. And again, they're thinking, well, it's just dance. It's fun. They're going to have fun. And, you know, they just get up and dance. So why should we pay for it? <laughs> right. I'm sure there's parallels to that in the other Middle Eastern as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's the classic story of uh, somebody haggles you down on the price, and then you get to the wedding, and there are ice sculptures everywhere. And one of those costs more than your show. Yes. Yes, been there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So, you know, when we talk about um, either social dancing or professional dancing, um, you know, is this something that's done by men, by women, by mixed groups? Um. Social dance is definitely done by both. Uh, classical dance, historically, it has been done by both, but I think um, probably like most cultures, um, it's dominated, primarily been dominated by women. And, uh, and even now, yeah, there are more women doing it than men, as far as I know. It tends to be, I don't know, Persian dance tends to be very feminine. It doesn't probably have to be that way. Maybe it's that way just because there are more women doing it. I don't know. But um, I, I have a really hard time uh, getting men interested in taking dance classes. I'm, I'm sure it's that way in um, more than just Persian culture. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's possibly because it could be um, the uh, – sorry, I'm getting a little distracted here. <laughs> um, Possibly because of the feminine aesthetics in there, it makes it uh, that much more difficult for men to become attracted to the style, um, especially when it comes to taking dance classes. I mean, socially, it's not a big deal because, um, you know, there are men who like to dance. Somebody, yeah. At a party, they get up and dance, not a problem. Um, but taking dance classes is a little bit, uh, it's like that in, in, Western, in the Western world, too. You know, there's that stigma of all, you know. Uh, I'm a man. I don't want to take dance classes. You know, I go into ballet class. So there's there's some of that. And uh, are there any stigmas around dancing, either socially or professionally? 
Uh, I guess it depends on how you define stigma. So definitely, I mean, things have changed some, but there's still definitely um, the the outlook on dance is, oh, yeah, it's a great uh, great thing to do, but as long as it's not my daughter doing it or, you know, uh, as long as my son's not going to marry a dancer, <laughs> you know, it's definitely that, that kind of stigma that it's a low-class thing or uh, even I, I had to go through that, you know, I... Um, I was uh, a good student academically, and it was a huge, huge shock to my poor family, my parents, uh, when I decided to go into dance. And they were just really, genuinely confused. Like, but why? Why are you going into this? But you're a good student. But you can be this. You could be that. You could be a doctor. You could be a lawyer. Why would you throw that away and become a dancer? You know, as if you know, you know, criteria for being a dancer is to not be smart. You know, <laughs> you could be smart and be a dancer. You know. Um, so there's definitely stigma, and, and that's also in Western culture, too. I realize that, but probably even more so in Persian culture. And then there's, of course, the stigma of, um, you know, you're flaunting your body around, and is there a sexual thing, and how, you know, there's prostitution uh, connected to the profession of dance for years and years. So there's still remnants of that. Um, so you're showing your body, dancing around for men to look at you. That's definitely, there's stigma around that. Why would you want to put yourself in that position? Um, there are people who say, oh, uh, well, I'm going to be classy. I'm just going to choreograph dances, but I'm not going to dance. You know, or, or some, I've had uh, people in the past where they, um, parents who have signed up their students and uh, told them that they can learn the skill of dancing um, and it's good exercise and, you know, it's an art form or whatever, but they're not going to perform because performing it is, you know, again, flaunting your body around in front of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, there's the religious aspect, too. The, those who are uh, strict Muslims who are religious um, just, um, you know, think it's sinful to do that, to uh, put your body on display like that. Um, and then there are those who are not religious who, and some who are even uh, artists and claim to be open-minded and everything and love other forms of art, other media, but when it comes to dance, it's not that they think it's sinful or anything, but it's still, um, it, they don't see it as high in artistic integrity like other art forms. It's like, ah, it, it's just dance. Or it's just, it's, um, there, there's no skill to it because it's your body. You're not learning to play an instrument. You're not holding a pen in your hand and using, learning to use it a certain way. It's just your body. And they don't realize that your body is an instrument as well. And mastering your body and making it move a certain way takes a lot of skill and talent and hard work. And also, I think because it makes it an earthy thing, and there's so much emphasis on Persian art being surreal and ethereal and heavenly and intellectual, you know, like the poetry, very dreamy and very intellectual, that bringing it into the body makes it more of an earthy, uh, corporeal thing. So that in itself is a, a bit of a blasphemy. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, it's not artistic anymore because it's earthy. Now you've, you've corrupted it with, you know, with the body. Huh. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And that's actually a great lead into my next question, which are, you know, what are some of the myths and misconceptions that people have about Persian dance, um, either in culture or by people who do the dance now or by belly mis- misconceptions that belly dancers have or anybody? Um, well, as a dancer, um, I, can tell from, I can tell you from my experience that um, one big misconception that dancers have is that because they see the flow that Persian dance has and they like that, uh, that, that kind of a natural, organic beauty, the flow to the dance, that they seem to think there, um, there's no rhythm involved or that rhythm is not a significant part of it. And they don't um, look for the pulse in the movement and in the music. And so I, I've kind of made it a mission when, on my workshop to really focus on that because that's the main thing I see missing when I see things on YouTube or, you know, I see people dance, is that they try to emulate the shape in the body, the line, 
and uh, they often do a nice job with that. But when you're watching them move and dance and you're listening to the music as someone who's really familiar with, with and you're understanding the music and how the music should go with it, um, something is missing because the pulse in the music is often ignored and and the pulse um, in the movement um, is not visible. And those two pulses need to uh, be together in order for the movement to really um, blend in with the music and become one with the music. So there's like a heartbeat that's missing. And I think Persians, whether they can articulate this or not, can feel it when they see a performance and they see a bunch of beautiful shapes, but somehow that heartbeat of the music and the dance aren't going together. It's just uh, there's something missing. It doesn't really um, have the right effect on, on the viewer, and it doesn't have the right effect on the dancer. Um, when I teach this and, and I talk about that and we play with uh, how, um, you know, finding the pulse in a certain movement and finding the pulse in the music and doing it in a certain way, um, I it's like uh, I see heads turn, I see like eyes get wide open and and all of a sudden, this, um, it's like this little door opens and, and this joy uh, starts to come into the body because you're making this connection that's so significant and so important um, in the expression of the dance form. And um, I, I see that people um, really get that when they get it. It's like, it's like a big aha moment. And that's something that I see missing. That's a misconception that there is no pulse or rhythm. Um, because of um, the flow that kind of takes over, and that's all people see is the flow of the music. Mm. All right. Well, that's an even greater lead into my next major section, uh, which is I'd like to talk about um, some of the form and aesthetics of the dance. Um, and earlier you used a phrase that I absolutely loved. Um, you called it a language of expression. Um, so, you know, what are some of the aesthetic features of Persian dance? What does it look like? Hmm. Well, that's hard to put in words. Um, it looks like the calligraphy and the textile. So, um, swirly lines, <laughs> um, a lot of curvilinear, you know, curved uh, shapes, and um, like a, a snaky kind of, um, you know, curves going in and out and swirling on the end. I'm just trying to kind of draw a picture verbally. Um, it, it's really difficult to explain it without moving my body, but um, you not only see it, I'd also look like a fool in the middle of Venice Airport. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but definitely, uh, I would say a curve. If I had to use one word, I'd say curve, as opposed to angular, uh, straight line. Uh, curve and um, smooth transitions between movements, which is what uh, brings that flow to uh, this style of dance. So, for example, you have uh, one shape that you might make with your body. Within that shape, you see curved lines, like the elbows are a little bit bent, shoulders are relaxed, you get a little bit of a curve in the arm. Uh, you might sit into the hip and, and kind of lift and curve the spine in a certain way so that your whole body is, has a curve to it. And you might extend the leg out to accentuate that curve going out of the, the leg and the foot and reaching uh, through the toes. Uh, then going from that position into the next one, which again will have some kind of curve into it, the kind of uh, pathway that you choose for the arm, for the spine to go through um, will be in such a way that would be a very smooth transition where you don't have to um, cut through space in an angular way or drop the arm and pick it up somewhere else, but you, you're in a curve and circular and spiral uh, pathway, you will go from one position to the next. I hope that makes sense. It's very abstract when I talk about it. But, um, it does, yeah. But one, yeah, <laughs> okay, good. Well, one good way to try to see that is um, by... Uh, looking at Persian miniature paintings, and this is something that people can just Google, so you can just Google image uh, Persian miniature paintings, especially 20th century paintings. Um, a lot of them were done by uh, this wonderful artist uh, by the last name uh, Farsh Chion. Um, I think it's F-A-R-S-H-C-H-I-A-N. Um, his work is 
very uh, a very good example of what I just described. So when you look at these Persian miniature paintings, you see the curvilinear composition. Uh, the eyes just sort of follow one thing that leads into another. There's smooth transitions between the images that are um, in the painting. And uh, you see that your eyes just move in a circular, spiral, curvy way um, as you look at the painting. There's, there are no um, jagged lines anywhere. And there's not one thing to look at. Your eyes just sort of follow, and you, you're just being led from one thing to another. It's just quite mesmerizing, actually. And that's the Persian miniature um, genre of dance actually inspired by Persian miniature paintings, which are often inspired by poetry. So it has a very, very poetic and dreamy feel to it, and smooth transitions, um, curved lines, things like that. And also the angle of the face is, uh, as far as the aesthetics, you're asking about a uh, 45-degree angle or three-quarter angle where you're looking towards the corner with a slight tilt in one direction with the other. It's a very common line or position or angle of the head, and you'll also see that in painting. So most often the face, when you're doing uh, different movements or positions, the face is at a 45-degree angle as opposed to a complete profile or completely uh, looking forward. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, what kinds of movements are emphasized? You know, for example, you know, in Rock Sharky, we do a lot of isolation or <laughs> partial isolation um, with an individual body part, very hip focused. Mm -hmm. um, is, is any of that true for Persian dance or do you have different focuses? Um, there are some isolations, definitely there are moments where you might stop and isolate. The isolations are more subtle and very uh, small, refined movements. There are isolations of the, the neck, of the shoulders, and sometimes the hips, but definitely not as much as in, um, in belly dance. There are um, just a few, like some circular hip movements and uh, uh, kind of upward on the diagonal. Um, hip movements that you do just to accentuate certain rhythms. Sometimes it's just one accent, uh, sometimes it's two or three accents, but you generally won't have a whole series of hip isolations, for example. More than anything, the hands um, are, are expressive, the curling hands kind of like a flamenco and waving, like a, like waving the hand. Um, you know, getting away from the wrist going out through, throughout the fingers. Um, a lot of arm movements um, that are combined with foot patterns. So, again, that's, the, that's where the rhythm comes in. A lot of people think, oh, Persian dance is all arm, because that's where visually we're seeing the shape and the arms and the upper body. But the feet under us are still very significant because they provide the rhythm and the accent and, you know, where the body goes. Uh, underneath, even though it's not like flamenco where we're making rhythms with our feet and the spotlight isn't on the feet, the rhythmic foot patterns are still very important in, in bringing the rhythm into the whole body. And the arms are making the shapes, and the arms are very much connected to the spine. So it's not just arm movement. When you move the arms, the spine is responding and, and moving with the arms, and the head is responding to the hand. There's a connection between the the face and the hands. There's a dialogue going on in the body. So it's very much a whole body experience. It's, that's kind of a misconception too, going back to your previous question, uh, that uh, Persian dance is all hands and arms. And it's not, you know, it's the, there's a lot of punctuation in the hand movement and action, but um, the arms are very significant, but it's really the arms and the spine. And what I mean by the spine is all the way up throughout the head, not separating the head. Uh, from the spine, um, but but taking that line, the the connection uh, between the arm moving and the spine kind of following all the way throughout the top of the head. Again, that's really abstract because I feel like I need to be demonstrating it as I'm talking. <laughs> Well, I know it's a little early to start um, doing any pitching, but I do want to mention um, that I have your book on Persian dance and a lot of the line drawings uh, really helped me understand some of the things that I had seen in performance. So uh, we'll talk about where folks can get your stuff a little bit later, but I want to put in a plug right now. So if you're having trouble imagining some of these things, that's going to be a great resource. All right. Um, now, and one thing that we've touched on kind of a lot in 
you know, the, the, pre, the discussion so far um, are some of the artistic values of the dance. So you mentioned things like this ethereal, dreamy quality and a very organic, natural yeah. flow, finding the pulse, um, really thinking of it as a poetic thing. Um, are there any other, you know, things that you would consider an artistic value that a dancer or choreographer feels is important to include or to accomplish when uh, in the dance? Um, I think as a choreographer, it it's important to either have, well, some choreographers like to have a story, and that's something that um, the audience really, really likes. So they often go for some kind of theatrical story or an abstract story um, or some kind of a concept. So having um, an inspiration of either a concept or a poem, poetry seems to be a really nice inspiration for a lot of art forms, whether it's um, theater or um you know, painting or music. A lot of times, the piece of music might be inspired by by poetry. Um, you know, basing your choreography on some concept, some poem, or something that has a, a deep meaning really adds a lot to it, both for the dancer and um, and for the audience. I think that's uh, that's a value aside from um, the other more tech technique you know, technical, aesthetic uh, values that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's one that I can think of. And and the mm, kind of uh, melding of the music and the dance together, becoming one, that's something that's, um, that's very important in Persian culture. Uh, we know it's like in contemporary um, Western dance, it's not. In fact, when I was studying modern dance, um, one thing we were always told was don't connect too much to the music, don't rely uh, on the music so much. Uh, take the music away, do the movement, and then go pick a different song and, and put it to it, which I totally appreciate as well, because uh, the movement has to stand on its own. And there's always the danger of us um, just sort of following the music and trying to uh, make a visual um, representation of the music that someone else has creatively you know, composed. Um, so I, I get that, but however way you you go through the process of creating your movement, when you get to the point that where you're performing it with a certain piece of music, the connection between the music and the movement really has to be there. Mm -hmm. And how about the dancer's relationship to the audience? Um, you know, for example, in Rock Sharky, it's very, very important for the dancer to connect to the audience. And we don't have that kind of fourth wall that you might get, say, if you were watching classical mm -hmm. ballet, where they're not interacting with you directly. Um, what role does that have in Persian dance? You know, there are different genres, and I've seen people do Persian dance differently. I think for the most part, when we're talking about that, um, the flowy, the, uh, the ethereal thing, um, and the poetry that's so dreamy, it, it's along the same line. You actually don't want so much of a direct uh, contact with the or connection with the audience. We want to keep it dreamy. That's part of the reason I think for that um, the 45 degree angle of the head is that you're not looking directly at the audience. You're looking off into space somewhere, off into infinity, um, and that makes it more dreamy and more abstract and less direct. Once you you make that that direct connection with the audience, it's like you again you're bringing it down to the earth. Right, you're making it really earthy, and you actually uh, lose something. You lose some of that dreamy quality. It's supposed to be, um, I don't know, more more than uh, us humans on Earth. Better. Uh, I'm having a hard time explaining it verbally, but it's and it's hard not to get distracted with all the people walking around me. But um, it's. Yeah, it, when you bring it down to earth, it's like you lose that quality. That uh, it's a higher, like a higher spiritual thing, I guess. I, I don't want to use the word spiritual because I don't want to get into a whole other genre with Sufism and you know religion and things like that. It's not. It's not a religious ritual kind of spiritual. Um, it's what I just. What I mean is just a non-earthy um, kind of um, you know cosmic you know uh, part of nature. That that kind of uh, that's what I mean by spirituality, and that's that that higher thing, that higher quality that you're trying to get with the poem, and um, and once you make that direct contact with the audience, you kind of lose that. So um, I have seen some Persian dancers 
where direct contact made, but that's when you go into more of um, entertainment as opposed to art. Like, I, I'm here and I'm entertaining you. Uh, I am me. I'm not representing some other higher thing or higher spirit. And look at me, look at how I move, and I'm here entertaining you. It's just very direct, and that's not as um, appreciated as something that's more ethereal, something that's symbolic, like the poetry is so symbolic. Um, when you symbolize something else on stage, it has a higher value in, in Persian art in general than if it's something that's um, very direct and human. Hmm. And are there, you know, particular images or references that come up a lot? Um, I know I've seen a lot of peacock motifs that dancers have used either in costuming or in yeah. body line. Um, yeah, I've seen some of that too. Um, I think, again, going back to poetry, uh, the symbolism of the moon uh, being beautiful and the face of a, woman, a woman's face being compared to the moon and how some of the movements like uh, waving of the hand, I call it nesting, um, which means breathe. You do this hand movement that goes around the face and it brings the attention to the face or, or certain movements where you frame the face with your hand and arm. Um, that often is inspired by uh, the poetry, the symbolic, uh, the symbolism of the moon representing the beautiful face of, of, of a woman. And in fact, even in everyday language, a lot of times we'll say, oh, she's so beautiful like the moon. You know, it's very common to say that. So there, there are things like that um, that stand out, or like the turning wheel. There are certain things that in old poetry are uh, uh, very well-known symbols of uh, the turning wheel is the world turning. And it's... Um, it kind of brings you into that space of um, I'm this small dot in the entire universe and the world just keeps eternally turning and turning. And, you know, that, that kind of feeling um, it creates a context for uh, the poem or the painting or the dance that you're doing. And probably that's why a lot of the movements are very circular too. A lot of the arm movements, a lot of the floor patterns that you make in your dance are very circular or spiral. Cool. Uh, you know, believe it or not, we've been talking for more than an hour. <laughs> uh, I still have wow. so much more that I'd like to ask you about, though. So I'm going to move on to the next section, if I may. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about some of the music that's used? Are there particular rhythms or instruments or genres we should uh, know about so we can start to understand what we're hearing? Well, I think um, by far most of Persian music that uh, you'd hear and want to dance to um, is uh, uses the six eight time signature. So I think as a dancer, you should definitely get familiar with that time signature, and that's the tricky one that is not always intuitive for the non-Persian ear uh, to hear. So um, uh, you know, I guess studying that a little bit with with a, a musician um, would be great. Or you know, um, I, there's a little section in my book that explains that as well. Uh, but understanding that, I mean, you don't have to study the notes, but just being able to hear a piece of music and say, ah, there, there's the beat. In order to find the beat, you have to understand that this is within a six-day time signature. Otherwise, you're going to be, you know, snapping on the wrong beat if you're trying to listen to it in a 4-4 in a or in a more even time signature. The uh, six-day time signature is very swingy. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, often, most often with the accents on the one and the four, which doesn't sound too strange if you're snapping your, your fingers on the one, four, five, six, one, three, four, five, one, the four, the one, the four, the four, the four, almost like a one, two, three, one, two, three waltz, just a little faster. However, uh, Persian music often accents it, it syncopates it a little bit, and so there is that underlying metronome that's doing the 6-8, but you don't always hear that because the rhythm is going in and out of that. And so you'll hear something like, and within that, like a um, metronome going on underneath, um, underneath that phrase. So um, understanding that, 
is, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a while <laughs> to get it. Um, my husband's a musician. He's actually a percussionist, but he's American, and he had never heard Persian music before. And it, it took him a long time to get it, and it just happened one day. He was sitting there, and it just finally clicked, and he <laughs> said, aha, I got it. <laughs> um, so definitely that rhythm. Uh, there are a lot of beautiful melodic instruments, like uh, the santur, which is a hammer dulcimer. There's um, string instruments like um, the setar and the tar, and then uh, percussive instruments, the daf, which is the frame drum with the ring. Um, that's a really beautiful, powerful instrument, and the tombak, which is the hand drum. And then there are the um, kind of violin-like instruments, um, kamanche. That's really, really beautiful, emotive, very emotive instrument, often used in uh, lori music. Um, so the melodic instruments are really nice to get used to as well. Uh, I like the music of um, Zolfanun. Um, Sima Bina uh, has some really nice folk music that's um, also uh, pretty easy listening and, and easy to, to dance to and really fun. And she has a beautiful, gorgeous, gorgeous voice. And that's Sima. You know, I think you dropped out for just a minute. Would you mind spelling her name for us? Oh, sure. Uh, Sima Bina is S-I-M-A, C-I-N-A. And, right. um, yeah, that's really beautiful folk music. Um, and then uh, Zolfanun is really nice, too. That's Z as in zebra, O-L, F as in Frank, O, N as in Nancy, O-U-N. Um, they're two brothers. Um, Jalal and Mahmoud, and both of the music is uh, is really beautiful to dance to. Great. Um, now make sure we include those names in the in the show notes. When, oh, okay. So if people are having trouble uh, writing that down, don't worry. We'll we'll have that written okay. down for you. Okay. Please continue. Oh, um, oh, I was going to say one more group that's really that they have uh, contemporary Persian music that's really nice to dance to is Shams Ensemble. That's S H A M as in Mary. S is in Sam ensemble. They have very dynamic music. I, I call uh, I call the contemporary music the after the war music <laughs> because after the Iran Iraq war, that it was an eight year brutal war. After that, uh, it seems like all the music that was based on classical music uh, just sounded more um, more fierce, but more dynamic and interesting as well. But before that, uh, the classical music is softer, more kind of meditative. Different different vibes. Awesome. Now, um, you know, what kind of costuming should dancers expect to see for a modern Persian dance performance these days? Um, I tend to look for, you know, as a dancer, I tend to look for uh, material that's dance material so that it kind of clings to the body so you can really see the body line because that's really what you're trying to show is the movement. Um, so that kind of a uh, jersey material and Something that a style that shows the flow, so something that lays um, on the body and then flows out like an A-line type of a dress. Um, and often uh, sleeves could be tight, so you can really see the, the line in the arms. But it, it's also nice to have bell sleeves because that bell part of uh, the sleeve um, adds flow to the movement as well. So the skirt and the sleeve would add flow, uh, but the rest really should just be um, bringing the attention to the line of the body and the movement. So I don't tend to put a lot of focus on the costume. I just like the costume to complement the movement because um, I, I think if you put too much emphasis on the costume, which we, we tend to sometimes get a little distracted with that because it's so much fun you know, playing with costume, but if the costume takes over the movement and that's what people remember, then as a dancer, I'm not satisfied with that. I feel like I haven't done my job as a dancer if people remember the costume more than remembering my movement. Mm -hmm. And is this always a dress or are there ever other pieces? Sometimes I like to wear uh, palazzo pants, the really wide-legged pants with a tunic so that you still have the flow but um, but you have a, a different look and the freedom to, if you're doing fusion or something, to lift up the legs and do kicks and do floor stuff that, that's easier to do. But you can also wear leggings and a tunic. I mean, it really depends on 
what you're trying to say with the dance. And I think um, to bring in the, the Persian motif, um, one idea is the flow, but uh, you don't always have to have a big long skirt. You can also use um, things like paisley and uh, what's called a eslimi, like an arabesque, uh, kind of a S-like shape. On, on your costume uh, using a decorative stuff um, and the prints um, on the material that you're using, you know, the textile, you can have uh, those motifs uh, bring the, the Persian uh, quality to your costume. It doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be a period costume. This is what I try to tell people is that even what, sometimes when people do so-called contemporary Persian dance, a lot of times they'll, they think that they have to wear something that was, you know, from 17th or 18th century or something like that. It does not have to, that doesn't have to be um, a, an actual attire that people wore in a, a time in history in order to be authentic. Because if you're a dancer, you're, just, you're wearing a dance costume and it needs to be something that aesthetically complements the flow of the style. And that's what's important. And, and the motif can be done in the decorations that you put on the costume. And Paisley is definitely a very common, very distinct Persian um, motif that you can use in, in your costume. Okay. All right. Now, you know, if we take a kind of a big step back and, you know, think about speaking to our belly dance audience specifically, um, you know, we've touched on a lot of these things, but just to summarize, you know, what are some of the biggest similarities that you see between Persian dance and Rock Sharky, either in the form or in the context? Okay, let's see. Probably foot pattern. I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm, I'm always focusing on the differences, but um, well, I'm going to ask I'm you about those too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, actually, the um, understanding of uh, what, what's called Nas, which is um, a kind of a, a coquettish, uh, very feminine expression that's subtle, um, it seems that uh, belly dancers really understand that uh, quickly and intuitively. I, I always see them um, get a smile on their face when I talk about it, when I do a certain movement that has that, you know, a little isolation of the head or shoulder or something that has uh, that kind of a attitude, real feminine coquettish attitude, they uh, tend to get that really quickly um, and enjoy that. So um, those little nuances in the attitude, um, are, I think there are similarities that they get, uh, even if they're expressed a little bit differently uh, between belly dance and Persian dance, it's something that they relate to, I think, um, when it comes to Middle Eastern culture, that's probably a, a very much a similarity. Yeah, and then as far as differences, um, one thing I've noticed is uh, the body line not being straight in Persian dance, that, that curved body line, and uh, letting the head um, move as a part of the spine and become a part of that line. In other words, not keeping the, the head straight all the time, but letting it tilt so that you're actually you're tilting your head so everything looks crooked uh, a lot of times um, while you're dancing, or you'll you swing from one angle to another, and you always you're you're almost always at some kind of an angle. You're not uh, vertical and upright uh, very often, so it's kind of disorienting if you're not used to it. And it's tough for belly dancers who um, are used to dancing with props, like balancing swords and things on their head, where they uh, really work hard to make that that separation in the neck where you can do all this cool stuff with your body but still keep the head straight so that you can balance something on top of it. This is the completely opposite of that. <laughs> so releasing the neck and letting the head go with the body as, as one part of the body or, or as your, that being a, you know, a one with your body is really um, difficult and challenging for, for some belly dancers. Um, and not, uh, not emphasizing the hips so much. Uh, like we might do a foot pattern that where you're supposed to keep the hips relaxed and let the hips kind of naturally wiggle under you as you do the foot pattern, but really the emphasis is on the feet. And there's a tendency for belly dancers to bring the emphasis more into the hip and try to do a specific rhythm with the hips. So kind of, uh, it's like not doing, doing less movement or minimal movement <laughs> is uh, a challenge sometimes. All right. And the hands, of course, so much uh, attention on the hands with Persian, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And what can belly dancers gain by studying Persian dance, either in its own right or as a tool to improve their raksharki? A lot of um, uh, belly dancers come to me because they want more um, definition in the arms and hands. Um, because Persian dance uh, deals with, with hands so much um, and wrists and you know, fingers, um, I think um, accentuating the movement in the hand for it's, it's kind of a little punctuation on the end. If you think of your arms as lines, the hand are like the end of the line. Uh, so think of a little swirl at the end of a line. It kind of finishes that line. Um, so it, it, it adds to your movement. It brings more shape to your movement. So in addition to everything that you do in the middle of the body, if you have a strong, well-defined arm position, and uh, well-defined hand movements that accentuate your arms. Um, it can really add to um, add, add to your dance. And um, some of the belly dancers just like to have Persian dance in the repertoire of the choreography because sometimes they're asked to do Persian dance or it's just an extra thing to say, oh yeah, I do belly dance, but I also do Persian. So it just gives you more things to offer. Excellent. And, you know, like anything, if I can chime in from my own experience, you know, cross training is just really good for you. It's good for your brain. It's good yeah. for you as an artist. And, you know, you never know when something is going to take over and become your new biggest passion. Oh, I agree. I totally agree. It really broadens your horizon. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I'm going to move on to the question and answer qu uh, section pretty soon so we can take some questions uh, from our listeners. But before we do that, you know, if people remember one thing from this call, if they really integrate one thing, what would you want that to be? Um, I think if you feel that you, there's something drawing you to this dance style, if you see it and you feel a passion for it and you want to learn about it, don't worry, don't hit the surface, don't worry so much about uh, what shape is this or what do I wear or that kind of thing, but really try to get deep in there and understand the the aesthetics, understand how the movement and the music go together. Try to um, look at it from all different angles, try to um, really learn about the aesthetics of the culture. So go look at the um, calligraphy, go look at the painting, go look at sculpture, you just listen to the music, different types of music all the time. Try to really um, immerse yourself in the culture in, in that sense. Go eat the food or whatever. And then play around with the movement by yourself to kind of try to get a sense of what it is about it that you like. And then you can, um, you know, you can take dance classes and, and then focus on the technique and all that, of course, is important. But I, so what I'm trying to say is, uh, is, is dig deep down and see what it is about it that intrigues you and try to learn it at that deep level rather than just trying to learn this move and that move and that move. Awesome. And if folks want to learn more from you, how can they do that? Um, I, uh, I teach workshops. I have uh, online classes. Um, on my website is actually through uh, Suhaila Salimpur's uh, website, but it'll take you take you there. Um, I also have uh, DVDs, both uh, this and on instant download. And then I have my book, The Art of Persian Dance, that's um, pretty complete and has um, all the movement and foot patterns and positions and, you know, um, all the illustrations that, that you mentioned and photos. And I have news. I'm almost done with uh, making an ebook version of my book. In the next few weeks, it's going to be out, and there's going to be a video clip of all the movements. So while you're looking at the illustration and reading the verbal description of the movement on the left side of the screen, on the right side, you're going to see um, you're going to see me demonstrating the movement. And you click on the names of the movements, and you'll actually hear the correct pronunciation uh, for the movement, because that's something um, that, that people were asking me to record and send to them, because they didn't know how um, to pronounce them. So I'm really excited about the ebook. I think it's going to really be helpful to have something that you can actually see the movement, and that's going to be out pretty soon. That sounds awesome. And uh, where's the best way for folks to get those? Should they go to your website or somewhere else? Yeah, my website is uh, just dancepersian.org. Awesome. 
Um, and for workshops specifically, uh, one of the reasons why we scheduled this call for this month is that uh, you've got a tour coming up, yeah? Uh, yes, yes, the West Coast and East Coast. Say that again? Um, yes, I have a, a tour of the West Coast in June and East Coast in July. Awesome. So I have some and of I'm the... in Europe right now. Awesome. So I have some details on the East Coast stuff in front of me. Um, I know that you've got July 27th in New Jersey, July 28th in D.C., July 29th in New York, July 30th here in Boston, and the 31st in New Hampshire. Um, I imagine that you probably don't have the West Coast dates in front of you since you're at the airport. Um, should people contact you if they want to hear more about the where you're going to be and when? I, I think I'm going to be in Santa Cruz on June 10th. And then uh, the following weekend, um, I don't know the exact locations, but I'll be down in L.A. in two different workshops in two different parts of L.A. Excellent. And I think that, that's it. That's a short talk. Great. And can people um, find registration information on your website, or should they get in touch directly with the sponsors? Um, yeah, I think with sponsors. And I'm a little bit behind on that, so once I get back into the country, I'll... Um, I'll get that stuff up on my website. Right now, there is a Facebook page for uh, the Santa Cruz um, workshop on the 10th. Uh, and that, so that should actually be on my Facebook page as well. So they can go to um, uh, Shaft.Dance Company. Um, that's my Facebook page. Okay. And um, that one's up. Yeah, the other ones um, we haven't quite put up yet. But we will. And I usually send out um, a monthly newsletter where I put all that information okay. on there. So um, if people are interested, if um, they go on my website, on the right-hand side, um, it just takes a few seconds. They just put their email address, and uh, they can subscribe to my newsletter. And then once a month, they'll uh, get a newsletter that will um, tell them where I'm having workshops and performances. And such. Great. So we'll include links to your Facebook page um, and also a direct link to your newsletter page in the show notes too, so if people can find them. Um, and I do also know because um, uh, the lady who's hosting uh, your Boston thing is my assistant, so I happen to know that registration for that one is at everendance, E-V-R-E-N-D-A-N-C-E dot com. So Boston or Boston adjacent listeners, that's where you can go. All right, so why don't we go ahead and open this up for questions. So folks who are listening um, on the phone or on Skype, you can press star star to unmute yourself. And if you're on Skype, that's star star on the Skype keypad. Um, or if you're listening on the webcast, um, you can type in questions. To do that, uh, you would have to click on the little uh, speech bubble that looks like a little square bubble with three dots in it. And that will give you a panel where you can type in your questions. So if anybody would like to ask a question or share your favorite thing that you learned, we would love to hear from you. One more time, that's star star on your phone or keypad. There's always a delay while the first person decides if they want to go first. <laughs> Don't be afraid, there are no wrong questions. <laughs> Nobody yet? Are you sure? <laughs> I think we discussed everything so thoroughly. Oh, we did. You know, there was so much more even that we could have talked about, but I, I don't want to keep you for too long. <laughs> and I know we've got folks calling in during their lunch breaks. All right. Well, I'm going to make this last call. So if anybody would like to ask a question or share your favorite tidbit, feel free. All right. Well, in that case, I think we're going to go ahead. So um, thank you so much, Shahrazad. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And, and I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, this is the end of our call, but that doesn't mean that the conversation has to end. We've got a private Facebook group just for Clubhouse listeners. So if you're subscribed to our list, you'll get an email shortly that will have an invitation to that group. Um, as always, there is a bit of a delay for approving new people because it's, uh, it's a closed group. Um, which means that we do, I do have to approve every person who joins. And that's just to make sure that it's really limited to dancers and not crazy people. Not crazy, that's a bad way of putting it. Uh, creepers. <laughs> um, sometimes belly dance groups attract, you know, people who really shouldn't be there. 
Uh, that email will also a link, include a link to the call recording. So if you want to hear this again, you can do that at any time. Um, a link to the show notes, which will have some of the references that came up during the call. Um, cool. So Shahrazad's references um, that you can purchase if you'd like to learn more, but also things like um, the artist names, et cetera, that were mentioned so that you don't have to come back through the recording for that information. I also have a link to our feedback survey, which is where you can suggest other topics or speakers um, or other ways that I can improve. Um, and our next call is coming up in May, and I can't tell you what it is yet because we're still finalizing uh, the angle that we're taking on the topic, but you're going to like it. And because that's our 50th call, we're going to be trying something a little bit different. <laughs> I'd also like to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Belly Dance Geek world. Um, it, on May 22nd through 26th, the Belly Dance Business Academy is having their first teaching summit. Uh, this is a huge event uh, with over a dozen teachers teaching on different topics related to teaching, whether that's the business of teaching, the process of teaching. Um, and I'm uh, going to be part of that event teaching how to teach improvisation. So. The summit is free for 48 hours. So that I believe that means that um, if the class that you're interested in is being posted on Monday, it will be available through Wednesday. Or you can pay a very reasonable fee um, for long-term access to that as well as some great bonus materials. So if you'd like to check that out, um, you can reach it at bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash, and I believe this has to be in all capitals, B-D-B-A for Belly Dance Business Academy, T-S for Teaching Summit. So one more time, that's bit.ly slash bdbats. Um, and again, that's totally free for a limited time, or you can pay for longer term access if you'd like. And the last thing that I want to say is that this is the come on in kind of clubhouse, not the no boys allowed kind. So that if you know that somebody else who would be interested in the topics that we're covering or joining us, you can invite them to sign up at bellydancegeek.com slash clubhouse. And until next time, happy dancing. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening. For more Geektacular resources, visit bellydancegeek.com.